All right, Mark Quayle. Well, let's say I know how to copyright my music, or I don't care about copywriting it. Why should I hire a music lawyer? Convince us. While writing a song may be the most important portion of the process of making money from music, the creative process is in vain if no one knows the song is available. A songwriter's talents are not put to best use by handling the administrative chores of making songs known. As such, a songwriter who wants to profit from making music should seek the services of a music publisher to handle those administrative chores. If it wasn't evident from the list of music publisher duties that I just went through, let me point out again that the development of songwriters and the placement of songs is a time-consuming, labor-intensive business that also requires a degree of luck to make a song a success. Most publishers will not want to spend the time required to give a song the best possible chance of becoming a hit unless that publisher can have a lasting participation in the song's future. As such, the business model adopted by music publishers is to acquire ownership in a song and then work to increase its value. This basic premise can be expanded by the other benefits that a music publisher can bring to the table, most notably payments of money in advance of any royalties actually being earned. This funding can often be the difference between harnessing a songwriter's talent and missing the opportunity completely because a cash advance can permit a songwriter to create full-time by removing concerns about earning money for living expenses. A publisher might also be able to offer funds for travel expenses and so permit the songwriter to visit other cities, notably Nashville, Los Angeles, and New York, to write with other high-caliber songwriters, all in the hope of writing a potentially lucrative musical work. These advantages go a long way to making a publishing deal attractive to a songwriter whose career is just beginning. And how exactly are music lawyers able to generate money from music? Okay, how is money made? Generally, there are six ways a songwriter can make musical works available to the public and expect to receive compensation. The first one is by authorizing a mechanical license for the musical work. This is one of the reproduction rights related to music that is generally established by the copyright acts in the countries that authorize it, including Canada and the United States. It involves granting a record company permission to manufacture records, tapes, CDs, and any other sound carrier format containing sound recordings of the musical works in question. Such permission in the music publishing business is called a mechanical license. The record company manufacturing the records is obliged to pay a royalty for each musical work for which copyright still exists and for every sound carrier unit that has been sold or otherwise distributed. International surveys on music publishing show that this royalty comprises about 30% of any music publisher's total annual earnings. The rate generally increases every two years, and as of January 1st, 2006, it goes up to 9.1 cents for each musical composition, five minutes in length or less, plus an additional 1.75 cents per minute for each minute over five minutes. Now, the next way to make money from songs is by authorizing the public performance of the musical work. As established by the various copyright acts in most countries, a songwriter has the right to control the performance of a song in public. Performance is often defined by using words like any acoustic or visual representation of a work, including a representation by means of a mechanical instrument, a radio receiving set, or a television receiving set. As a result, radio stations, television or cable networks, restaurants, subject to certain exceptions, dance clubs, and other venues which use music are required to obtain permission for the right to do so. The fees paid for these licenses by such users are generally referred to as public performance royalties. International surveys on music publishing show that this royalty comprises approximately 45% of a music publisher's total annual earnings. Our third way of money collection for songs is by authorizing the inclusion of the musical work in a film or television production. This is another variation of the reproduction right. 
Fees can be derived from the license of the musical work for use in motion pictures, cable or broadcast television productions, commercials, satellite broadcasts, videotapes, interactive media, websites, etc. In the music publishing business, such a license is called a synchronization license because the musical work is used in synchronous or timed relation to the moving pictures. These licenses dictate the terms upon which the production can utilize the song in question. Items such as the fee, the duration of the permission, the amount of the song to be used, and the permitted territory are the most important deal points. The fees for such uses are dictated by the market and are reached by negotiation between the musical works administrator and the intended user. Again, international surveys on music publishing show that this royalty comprises approximately 10% of a music publisher's total annual earnings, and that figure is growing each year. The fourth way to make money that we'll look at is by authorizing the musical work to be sold or distributed in print form. This is another form of the general reproduction right granted in most copyright acts. As was mentioned earlier, while sales of musical works printed on paper generated the largest share of a music publisher's income in the first decades of the 20th century, such sales represent only a small share of the overall income today. International music publishing surveys show that this royalty comprises approximately 5-10% to of a music publisher's total annual earnings. Another way that money can be made is by authorizing the musical work to be sold or distributed using new technologies. In the 1990s, this category was very small. With the rise of improved and smaller electronics, a music publisher can now publish its musical works in such items as greeting cards and other forms of merchandising, streaming audio from websites, digital downloads, MIDI files, software or multimedia products and the like. Such new uses like website streaming raise complicated issues that blend some of the traditional concepts of reproduction rights when the musical work is fixed on a computer hard drive and performance rights when that same work is then streamed to the user. While these uses generate a small income now, it is expected that such uses will grow to rival the traditional uses in the coming decades. The final category I will mention is not found in the U.S., but exists in Canada, and that is the private copying or the blank media levy. The 1997 amendments to the Canadian Copyright Act legalized the copying of sound recordings for private use, generally known as home taping. As a result from this change in the law, this new regime also provides for a levy to be added to the price of blank recording media cassettes, CDRs, CDRWs, mini-discs, etc., which is in turn paid as a royalty to the various rights holders. This levy came into effect originally in the year 2000, and it is paid by the manufacturers and importers of blank recording media and is collected by the Canadian Private Copying Collective, otherwise known as the CPCC. Now that's really interesting, and in the United States, we're also going to have to come up with creative new ways to make money from music in this changing music business. Are we also going to add a tax on blank media? I don't know. But someone's going to have to establish what the laws are going to be in the future for intellectual property ownership. And anyone from the Sonic Arts Center who understands all this new technology is in a good position to be able to do that. Okay, I've got one more great Bob Donnelly story for you before we finish out the presentation. 